Have you ever been scammed? How did that make you feel? Did you know that the biggest scam in the history of the world has led to one of the greatest counterfeits ever? I'm Cami Utman, and I'll be sharing how to avoid the greatest counterfeit in the history of humanity. Welcome to Unlocking Bible Prophecies. The rise of an international pandemic, about the coronavirus. polarizing global politics, the mismanagement and corruption, increasingly destructive natural disasters, and the bushfires in Australia are a warning of what may be to come around the world. What does it all mean? What does the future hold? Join international speaker Kami Utman on a journey for answers in unlocking Bible prophecies. In her travels around the world, she's come face to face with real life struggles, but in the midst of them, she's found miracles of hope. Join Kami Utman for Unlocking Bible Prophecies as she shares how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled faster than ever before. Thank you for joining me for Unlocking Bible Prophecies. I have enjoyed so much the opportunity to share with each one of you. Now, if this is your first time watching, let us know by leaving a comment in the chat. I'm glad you're here. Now, if you have happened to miss yesterday's program on the Bible Sabbath, don't worry. Just go to awr.org forward slash Bible and you'll find it in the archives. Last night, we saw that the Sabbath is the authentic seal of God. You may be wondering then, why do so many worship on a different day? Tonight, you may be shocked to find out the reason. Recently, I encountered a pagan village chief on a remote island who was also shocked by what he heard regarding the Sabbath. You'll have to wait to hear what he did next. Remember, you can click the link below to enroll in our online Bible school. Millions have found these lessons to be so important in their spiritual growth. You can submit a question to our live online Bible instructors as they are anxious to hear your questions and provide you with biblical answers. Would you like prayer over something you are struggling with? Then click below to submit your prayer request. Let's pray together now and then get right into our subject, the counterfeit. Heavenly Father, Lord, please have us become acutely aware of the times in which we live, sharpen our minds, open our hearts to take in your truth and have us, have us be warned by your word of what we need to do, how we need to handle it, uh, because we want to follow your path, Lord, and only you. So we love you and in Jesus' precious, powerful name, amen. Have you ever noticed that things aren't always as they appear? Consider the story of the spider. Aristotle classified the spider as an insect. Insects, it was known, have six legs. Nobody questioned the great Aristotle for 1,700 years. It was just commonly assumed that spiders were insects and therefore had six legs. It was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck who presented the classification of the spider as, a, as an arachnid having eight legs. Merely because something is believed for centuries does not make it true. Could it be that a tradition, like one of those long-held ideas, has slipped into the Christian church? Is it possible that many have accepted falsehood in the place of truth and very few people today question it? Could it be that the Christian church has allowed man's tradition to overshadow God's way? A tradition so old that almost no one knows how it started. A tradition nearly all Christians accept thinking they are following God's law, when in fact, they are following the thoughts of man. That is why we have chosen this theme for our meetings. If it's in the Bible, then I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, then it's not for me. The book of Revelation predicts that Satan would attempt to mislead the Christian church. Revelation 12, 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Satan is a deceiver. His goal is to overthrow God's throne. The foundation of any government lies in its authority and ability to make laws. If your subjects refuse to follow your laws, they really are refusing to be your subjects. Satan has attacked God's law, but right in the heart of his law, is the Sabbath. So isn't it logical that Satan, the master of counterfeit, 
would attack the Creator by challenging the symbol of creation, the Sabbath? There are honest-hearted Christians who read the Ten Commandments written with God's own finger and see the Fourth Commandment in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 10, where it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. When they read that, they become confused because the church that they're attending keeps Sunday, the first day, not the seventh day Sabbath. Surely then the holy day must have been changed in the New Testament. Strangely, the first day, meaning Sunday, is not even mentioned in Revelation anywhere and only shows up eight times in other New Testament books. So if people think there is a command to keep Sunday holy, we should find it in one of these Bible passages talking about the first day, right? Let's study. Since millions of sincere and loving Bible-believing Christians worship on Sunday, why is the Bible curiously silent on this subject? Could it be that much more is involved here than actually appears on the surface? Yes. One of the greatest prophecies of the book of Revelation involves the subject of Sunday worship. But first, it would be impossible to understand this important prophecy unless the topic for today becomes crystal clear. There are only eight New Testament scriptures regarding the first day of the week in the Bible. In the Bible, Sunday is always called the first day of the week. Saturday is always called the seventh day. Numbers are used to mark the days of the week from Genesis to Revelation. As we read these eight scriptures, take a mental note of whether or not any of these texts suggest that the first day should now be kept holy. Consider text number one, Mark 16, 9. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven de demons. Here we see that Jesus' resurrection was on the first day of the week, Sunday. Christians around the world celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday every year. Let's go to text two, Matthew 28, verse one. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Note, the Sabbath is ending here in this verse, and then Sunday comes. Does this tell us that the first day of the week is now holy? No. Text three, John 20, verse one. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Okay, let's stop and think. So far, do any of these three verses suggest that the first day is to now be considered holy? No. Text four, Mark 16, one to two. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very, in the, very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. We know Jesus was crucified on Friday evening. Friday has always been called the preparation day because they were to prepare for God's holy Sabbath day, Saturday. Jesus then rested in the tomb over the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, Saturday. And then Jesus rose on Sunday, the first day of the week. Sunday is the day of Jesus' resurrection. Text number five, Luke 24, one. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb. Okay, there is zero instruction here that Sunday is now God's holy Sabbath. Text six, John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. Some say they gathered to inaugurate the keeping of the first day of the week, Sunday as a holy day. But the disciples could not have inaugurated a new holy day in honor of the resurrection because until Jesus appeared in their midst, they refused to believe he was raised. 
And that's proven in Mark 16, 14, when it says, later he appeared. He, Jesus, rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Okay, friends, so far, these six passages say nothing about changing God's holy Sabbath day to the first day, Sunday. But let's keep looking. We have two more texts that mention the first day of the week. Text number seven, 1 Corinthians 16, one to two. Now concerning the collection uh, for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, uh, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. <clears throat> Paul is instructing to set aside some of their money at the beginning of the week, so they would have it ready for their Sabbath offering. You see, Paul was gathering funds for the Jerusalem Christians who were suffering from famine. So he wrote ahead of time to the churches that he would visit, asking that each believer put money aside weekly so it would be ready when he arrived. Okay, text eight, our final text. Acts 20, verse seven. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Does this text say to observe Sunday as a holy day or that the seventh day Sabbath was changed to the first day? No. The fact that they broke bread or celebrated communion at this service does not indicate the day was now holy because the Bible says they broke bread every day. In Acts 2.46 says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. We have now looked at all eight texts in the New Testament that refer to the first day. You have now seen for yourself that there was never any hint of any change. So how did a change in the day of worship come about? Is one of the days a counterfeit? Many honest Christians read in Luke 4.16 that Jesus, as his custom was, went to church on the seventh day Sabbath. Christ said in Matthew 24.20, that his disciples would be keeping the Sabbath 40 years after the cross, when he said, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. In Acts 13, 42, 44, the apostle Paul taught almost a whole city to keep the seventh day Sabbath. Christians then read in Revelation 1:10 that the Lord has a day. Then they read in Luke 6, 5, that the Sabbath is the Lord's day. They read the same thing again in Mark 2, 27, 28, and Matthew 12, 8. They are confused and ask, who changed the Bible Sabbath? Well, certainly God didn't, because the Bible says, Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. I'm grateful for that, because I can have an assurity in His Word that it's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I love that about our God. Then they look at the Bible and they see Jesus didn't change the Sabbath because the Bible promises in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God did not change the Sabbath. Jesus would not change the Sabbath and the disciples could not change the Sabbath. Acts 5, 29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So the question is then, who did it? In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, there is a beast that rises up out of the sea. This chapter is where we read about the mark of the beast and 666. But notice how the beast is, is described. Now friends, let me just say this. Beasts in the Bible are symbolic of kingdoms and powers, not actual monsters that come up out of the sea, okay? All right, Jesus loves us and, and, and the book of Revelation is his love letter to us. So let's, let's read that with that in mind. Revelation 13, one. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and on his horn, 10 crowns and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Here's a perfect example. Here's a beast in the Bible that represents a political or religious power or kingdom. This power that rises up is a blasphemous power. It claims rights and powers that only belong to God. It continues. 
Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Who is the dragon? Satan. He imbues this power with great authority. The whole world listens to it declare its own laws in place of God's law. The Sabbath became a particular object of attack. To understand this beast, we go back to the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter. Here we have the same imagery as Revelation 13, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and the dragon. Daniel 7 gives us the key to unlock Revelation 13 and understand the whole subject of the mark of the beast and 666. I love that God has written his word so that from the beginning to the end, it's consistent and it all goes together. You need every bit of it. Let's look in Daniel 7, verse two and three. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Notice this key to interpret Bible prophecy. Daniel 7:17. 7, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. Daniel 7, 23. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So Daniel sees four beasts that represent four kingdoms. These four world-ruling kingdoms, which start in Daniel's day, take us down the stream of time. If you were with us on the first night for the first presentation, you remember we saw four kingdoms in Daniel chapter 2. Those medals in the image that represented Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and divided Europe. This vision of the beast adds more information to the vision in Daniel 2. It brings to light a power from the time of divided Europe that would arise and attempt to change God's law. Let's look at how the Bible predicts these events and see clearly how history confirms what actually happened. Now the first beast, Daniel 7 verse 4 says, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. Okay. When the archaeologists were digging in Iraq near the site of ancient Babylon, they found engravings on the walls of a lion with eagle's wings. In the ancient world, people knew that lions symbolized Babylon. Then another nation was to rise. Babylon wouldn't rule the world forever. Daniel 7, verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. The combined kingdoms of Medea and Persia overthrew Babylon. The bear of Medo-Persia raising itself up on one side represents the Persians overthrowing the first, Babylon, and then dominating the Medes. What does the bear have in its mouth? Three ribs. You see, when Medo-Persia conquered the world, it first conquered Babylon, then it went northward and conquered Lydia, then southward and conquered Egypt. These three nations, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt, represent the three ribs. Can you see how accurate Bible prophecy is? I love it. The third empire rises in Daniel 7, verse 6. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Greece became the third nation that was predicted to rise. We know that Alexander the Great was the most prominent Greek leader. He was just over 30 years of age when he conquered the entire then known world, and so quickly. Can you see why Greece is depicted as a leopard with wings? But what do the four heads represent? Alexander the Great died when he was 33 years old. Unlike most kingdoms, Alexander's sons didn't take the throne. Instead, his four generals divided up the Greek empire and each took a portion to rule over. Thus the four-headed leopard. Friends, it is so important for you and me to know the prophetic rise and fall of these kingdoms. It matters 
because we must know for our futures that when the Bible warns that something is going to happen, we can believe it. And we believe that it does happen exactly as it says and right on time. We can assuredly take God at his word as he warns us not to scare us, but to prepare us. Let's continue. The Bible describes a fourth empire, Daniel 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It, had, it was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. It is very clear that this fourth beast with iron teeth represents the iron kingdom of Rome. This period takes us to the time of Christ, when Rome ruled the world. Christianity grew up in this Roman Empire. The Bible describes the collapse of the Roman Empire clearly in the symbolism of the toes of the image and the horns of the fourth beast. The image of Daniel 2 had feet and toes of iron and clay, representing Europe. The fourth beast here has ten horns. History shows Rome was divided into ten main divisions. Awesome! During the time the barbarian tribes were taking over Europe, religious apostasy entered the church and there was conflict over worship and the Sabbath was changed. Daniel 7 verse 8, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the hor first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. In Europe, among these ten horns, there is another power that rises, a little horn that's different from all the rest. The Bible gives us evidence to clearly identify this power. First, this little horn comes up among the first ten horns. So if the ten horns are divisions of Rome, then this little horn has to come up within Western Rome, excuse me, Western Europe. This little horn doesn't come up in Asia, Africa, or the Americas. Its roots are in European soil. Secondly, the Bible says this little horn would arise after the ten horns. So then it cannot come up at all in the days of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, or Rome. It has to come up after the fall of Roman Empire. Be clear on that, friends, because there's a lot of other theories out there that are not biblical. It has to come up after the fall of Rome. The Bible also says that this little horn has eyes like a man. Eyes represent intelligence, but it is a man's wisdom, not God's. It is a human, religious system based on man's teachings, which would rise out of Rome. Notice the Bible says in Daniel 7, 24, that it is diverse or different than all the rest. It says, he shall be different from the first ones. Because it is not primarily a political power, it is also a religious power, a religio-political power. What would this power do? It would attempt to change the very law of God. Daniel 7.25 predicts, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Might that be the Sabbath? Can you think of any greater words against the Most High than claiming to have the authority to change God's law? This is obviously speaking about divine laws, not insignificant tax or political laws. Daniel 8.12 tells us that this little horn, power, would cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So coming out of the old Roman Empire, a religious power would rise. It would be small at first, but it would become extremely powerful. It would use its power to claim authority, to change the very law of God. History records for us a gradual change that took place from Sabbath to Sunday. 
Dr. John Eady documents the roots of this change in his Bible Encyclopedia on page 561. He says, Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshiped the sun. Sun worship was accepted and prevalent through Egypt, Babylon, Persia, and Rome. Even the days of the week were affected. History shows us that the Greeks and Romans named the days of the week after planetary bodies. Many were called after their gods and goddesses. Let's look. Sunday, the day of the sun god. Monday, the day of the moon god. Tuesday is for Tuia, the god of war. Wednesday is Odin's day, the carrier of the dead. Thursday is the god of thunder, Thor. Friday, the day of Freya, the goddess of love, beauty, and fertility. Saturday, the day of Saturn, god of reaping harvest. Hmm. So once again, mythology was incorporated into our way of thinking in today's society. Keep in mind that God, in the Bible, marks the days by numbers. So we have the first day, the seventh day, and that's all throughout Old Testament and New Testament. God refers to the days by numbers. All right, when you come to the fourth century, the Roman Emperor Constantine had strong devotion to worshiping the sun, even putting the sun god on the coins he minted. But he had a dilemma. Rome was falling apart. Constantine desired to unite his empire. He came up with what he thought was a brilliant idea. Why not unite the empire around Sunday worship? You see, Constantine had looked up at the sun before a battle and saw a cross of light above, and with it, the Greek words meaning, in this sign, conquer. Constantine commanded his troops to adorn their shields with a Christian symbol, and thereafter, they were victorious. Here comes the combination of sun worship and Christianity. Constantine's decree in 321 AD says, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all the shops be closed. In an attempt to unite the empire, Constantine issued the first Sunday law. In the days of Constantine, he marched his armies through a river and then deemed them baptized. That's just a bunch of wet pagans. Here, church and state joined hands in an attempt to Christianize the pagans and unite the empire. The Roman government and the Roman church united. And here's an amazing statement that is really incredible. It's from March 1994 in the Catholic World, page 809. Quote, The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is in truth something royal, kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of justice. Hence, the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, it shall remain consecrated and sanctified. And thus, the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, the mythic sun god, became the Christian sun day. Do you see how Sunday came into the church? Christians, to escape persecution, had for several years been asking to distinguish themselves from the Jews. Sunday gradually became emphasized because of Christ's resurrection and gradually church leaders to make the pagan sun worshipers more comfortable began keeping Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath. Constantine wanted to unite his empire and Roman church leaders wanted to convert the pagans. So Sunday became the vehicle to accomplish both. The biblical Sabbath was changed by the Roman church and state. God didn't change it. Jesus didn't change it. The disciples didn't change it. And you would have to convince me that over 20 million Jews woke up one day and forgot what day of the week it was. As a nation, they have been keeping the Sabbath, the seventh day Saturday, since before the Exodus. The Catholic Church Council of Laodicea 
records the first prohibition of keeping the Bible Sabbath. The Roman Catholic bishops met there and look at what happened at the Council of Laodicea in 325 AD. Quote, Christians shall not Judaize, that is, they shall not keep the Sabbath and be idle on Saturday. But the Lord's Day they shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do not work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. End quote. So here is a church council that unites with the Roman government under Constantine and says we are shifting the authority of Sabbath to Sunday. This will unite the empire and distance us from the Jews. In doing so, however, they were unconsciously fulfilling Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 7.25, and shall think to change times and laws, stressing that an earthly power growing up out of Rome would attempt to change God's law. God says, beware. Now let's go to the Converts Catechism, a Roman Catholic instructional guide, and read the answer regarding the change of the Sabbath. This is very clear, friends. Question, which is a Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is a Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Answer, because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now I'd like to pause right here. It is important for me personally to tell you that we will be addressing a lot of heavy topics and I will be quoting different historical documents that are not intended to accuse individuals, but to show prophecy fulfilling. I believe there are many priests and faithful believers in Roman Catholicism who serve God to the best of their ability and are seen by God as his children. The information quoted here is directed only towards the system, the Roman Catholic system, that has a number of doctrines which we will see clearly go against Scripture. And as truth seekers, it is my sincere desire to lay the clear word of God before you, so you may decide for yourself what is truth and what is error. Okay, are you aware that the Catholic Church modified God's Ten Commandments? Let's go to their own document, the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 4, page 153. It says, quote, the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day. End quote. The Catholic Encyclopedia states that the commandment regarding time had been changed by the church. By the way, some may have noticed that this statement refers to the third commandment, but we have already seen in the Bible with our own eyes that the Sabbath is the fourth commandment. The Roman power of the Middle Ages also changed the law of God by removing the second commandment, the one prohibiting image saint idol worship. Hmm. Since they now only have nine commandments, gotta get it back to 10. So they took the 10th, thou shalt not covet, and divided it into two. Solved. This illustrates the mindset of the church overriding the word of God. Carl Keating, one of the foremost Catholic lay scholars, wrote a book as a challenge to Protestants. This Catholic author is reasoning with Protestants, saying, if you want to go to the Bible, you should keep the Bible Sabbath. Let's read his words in Catholicism and Fundamentalism on page 38. Quote, Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday, yet there's no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath, or day of rest, was of course Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. End quote. In other words, if you don't want to go to the Bible, he's saying you should go back to the Catholic Church 
who freely claims the authority to change God's law as it sees fit. Well, wait a minute. God gives clear warnings about messing with him or his word. Revelation 22, 18, 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city. This is serious, friends. Then in Matthew 15, 3 through 9, he, Jesus, answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. Thus you have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Sunday sacredness has came from the tradition and commandments of men. Who will you follow, God or man? The issue is much more than a matter of one day versus another. The issue is, what is your guide? Is it the Bible or is it tradition? The issue is, does any human church or human religious leader, for whatever reason or motive, have the authority to change God's law that was written with his finger on those tables of stone? It's all about who has the authority. Who do we demonstrate who we worship? The rebellion of Satan revolves around worship. It is the theme of right or wrong, and it began in Genesis. The story of Cain and Abel depicts two types of people who travel two different paths in life. One worshiped the way God prescribed, and one definitely did not. Which one was blessed and accepted by God? Which one's pride led to murder and was cursed by God? While Cain and Abel were raised by the same parents, they had held different attitudes about God and his authority. This is where their paths diverge. Abel saw the mercy of God in the way the Creator provided for the redemption of the human race. But Cain rebelled against God in his heart. The distinction may not have been obvious until it came time to bring their sacrifice before God. The drama between Cain and Abel is really about the struggle between Cain and himself. Although Cain was given a chance to turn around, he held ever more tightly to his stubborn pride and stumbled further away from God. God's plan for salvation is not neg negotiable. It is a gift. The human heart, when it clings proudly to self and tradition, stumbles on a slippery downhill slope of destruction. God constantly reaches out to those who rebel to give them an opportunity to make a turnaround, a repentance. You are not born a winner, and you are not born a loser. You are born a chooser. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Often Satan's strategy is to cause me to ignore or break just one of God's commandments. James 2, 10 through 12 tells us why. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. God's law is like a ten-sided fortress. Only one side needs to be broken down to permit the enemy to enter. Give the devil an inch, and he will become your ruler. To give up the Bible Sabbath, given by God as a sign of his creative authority, does matter, friend. I choose to follow what God gave to Adam in the Garden of Eden. I choose to follow the examples of Christ himself. What about you? God says the Sabbath is a great sign. It's a sign of our loyalty to Christ. It is a sign we believe he created our world. In the Garden of Eden, Satan said to Eve, what difference does a tree make? All trees are alike. And Eve lost Eden because she bought that lie. And many Christians today are buying into, this, into a deception. People say, what difference does a day make? All days are alike. With God, all days are not alike. One day was blessed by God, the seventh. One day was sanctified by God, set aside, and God rested on only one day, the Sabbath. 
The issues that we are dealing with are issues of authority, issues of obedience. Our choice is the Bible or tradition, Jesus or religious leaders, God's law or man's dogmas, God's instruction or human teaching, God's way or man's way. Does this mean that everyone who keeps Sunday is lost? No. There are many Sunday-keeping Christians who love Jesus. Everyone who keeps Sunday is not lost. They may be living up to all the light they know. The difference is when they learn more and are, are they willing to follow it? This makes me think of Perfecto, in a remote village high in the mountains of Mindoro, Philippines. There he lives as an influential pagan chief. You see, spiritualism and local lore were his way of life. Sometimes people would visit the village and try to convert him to Christianity, but what they said was different from what they practiced and the confusion annoyed him. He would tell them to go away. Then he would find comfort in his prized possession, his radio. He only listened to one station because it played the music that he liked. And one day after his favorite song ended, a new program came on which caught his attention. The broadcaster talked about the seventh day Sabbath as the true day of rest. This was new to him and was different from what other Christians had professed. Happily, he went to the Sunday keepers in his village and told them that they were worshiping on the wrong day because of what he had heard on the radio. He was surprised when these people showed a real interest in what he shared. After that, he called the whole village together to listen to his radio. Everyone loved the program. The next day, they all gathered together, hoping to hear more. They rejoiced when the program came on. Perfecto was convinced that what he was hearing was the truth. He sought out the radio broadcaster and told him that his whole village wanted to be baptized, all 77 of them. The Bible truth changed not only his life, but the life of the entire village. I'll never forget seeing Perfecto coming up out of the water and raising his hands to Jesus at his baptism, where 1,400 other souls joined him in giving their lives to Christ. In Revelation 14, 12, God's word says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. In the last days of earth's history, God will have a group of people who love Jesus. They love him so much that they obey at all costs. Like the one woman who made her way to the baptismal site at a nearby lake. She had attended prophecy meetings just like this, but her husband had disagreed with her attendance. So on the day for her to be baptized, she left the house in her white robe and her husband secretly followed her. He grabbed a machete and held it behind his back. The pastor was calling for the people to enter the water. And as she made her way, her husband abruptly stopped her and threatened that she better not take one more step or that be her last. As he slowly revealed the knife behind his back, she continued as the water reached her ankles, then her calves, then to her knees, and she whispered, no one will stop me from taking Jesus as my savior. Well, he aggressively challenged her, not one more step. And she closed her eyes and moved forward saying, I give myself to Jesus. I learned the truth and I will not turn back. Tears began to fall from her eyes and what she didn't see were the tears falling from her husband's eyes. Suddenly, there was silence as everyone was watching. The husband raised his knife only to drop it and declare, if you're willing to give up your life for this Jesus, then I want to know him too. Friend, are you willing to follow wherever Jesus leads, regardless of the consequences? Though the road may sometimes be difficult, it leads to the tree of life in the city of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, the truth is calling and we cry out to you, Jesus, for mercy and strength. Give us the gift of discernment and understanding to see clearly 
as we place our trust completely in you. There is nothing in this world worth losing our own soul over. Protect our commitment to follow every Bible truth you reveal to us in your holy word. Bless each listener tonight. In Jesus' precious, powerful name, amen. Before we close tonight, friends, I would like to give you the opportunity to respond to the message you've just heard. If you would kindly answer one or more of the following options. The first option is, the subject of the Bible Sabbath is clear to me. If you agree, just click on that. Second, I understand that the Bible Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. Third, I accept and believe that the seventh day of the week is the Sabbath of God's holy commandments, and I want to keep the Sabbath day holy. Fourth, I would like more materi material about the Sabbath. And then last, some of you have already been asking about this. I would like to be baptized and begin the process to do so. Just go ahead and click the link to give your response. Friends, there are people standing by right now to answer any question you may have or to pray with you. Just click the link to be connected. Now, make sure you join me tomorrow night for this important topic that you won't want to miss. What does the Bible say happens when you die? You might find it different than what many people think. God bless you and see you tomorrow for our topic, The Grave where we will be unlocking more Bible prophecies. Choose God's way. Good night, friends.